sometimes I think uh, we we can forget things. I mean, you know, the original title of my book, uh, Secret Knowledge, my original title was Lost Knowledge. And uh, I think knowledge has been lost in the past anyway, we know. I mean, you think of the, the burning of the... Um, uh, library in Alexandria, we know what was in it, or they know what, what was in it. Uh, a vast amount of Greek literature was lost, wasn't it? And uh, I think there was, as I say, lost knowledge in the past, and I suspect there will be in the future. Um, just as you can lose things, it's amazing you can lose things in libraries, can't you? Meaning, as you keep stacking and they find a Mozart manuscript, where do they find it? In a library or something, don't they? Beckman Archive. It was about two million photographs uh, in an archive and some very, very good photographs. And this is how things can be lost. I'll give you that. And very, very good photographs. And... Uh, but they were in, stored in boxes or something, and not that well, and the paper is beginning to rot, you see. The paper has to be preserved. And Bill Gates purchased it with the intention of digitalizing this archive. But to digitalize it, then, required uh, somebody to look at each photograph and type in any word that might bring it back. That would mean you'd need rather good people who had good eyes and a good vocabulary. Well, if you've got very good eyes and a good vocabulary, would you want to spend your life going through two million photographs from the past? Well, no. And they realized it couldn't be done that way anyway. And uh, they've, all, you know, they're always working on visual recognition for computers, but it's not easy. It always makes reads things. They're working on it, trying to do it. But what happened was, this is how you know the story. It was in the front page of the New York Times, and they buried it in a salt mine in Pennsylvania to preserve the paper or something, and. Met people. Some people said, well, it's buried, it's lost. And others said, they took out the best photographs. They did take out the iconic photographs. But others said, uh, yes, some people said it's lost. Others said, well, they might be found again in 500 years and they'll know what to do or something like that. But anyway, it's just an example of how things can be lost. You know, a lot of artists in the 17th, 18th century knew about cameras. The, the, the cameras were manufactured from the 17th century, as they were. And uh, uh, not many people would ever see them. Uh, they were made for artists. And uh, in a way, when photography comes along, it's using the camera. I mean, the cameras weren't made for photographers. There weren't any photographers before photography. And... Uh, in fact, I've, I've often pointed out um, the Danish uh, Golden Age painters, Kup, Kupka, Christian Kupka, uh, probably used cameras. It looks like it to me. Now, they're lovely pictures. The cameras didn't make the picture. He makes the picture. But it's camera vision, always perspective and so on. And uh, when you think of it, the birth of photography is really the birth of uh, the invention. is isn't the invention of the camera. The invention is chemicals to freeze the image. And it's always there's a kind of art history has never known quite how to deal with photography. They don't know how to, where exactly to put it. If you're dealing with a history of images, you have to, you'd ha be forced to deal with it, but art history pretends it's a history of art and images are separate. A lot of art is images, but not all images are art, they'd say. Okay, 
Uh, on the other hand, images are powerful, they have power, great power. Um, so there's a kind of murky history around just before photography and just after. And uh, it took quite a while to develop. But remember the famous remark by Della Roche, uh, from today painting is dead, comes from his report to the French government about the invention, the, da the daguerreotype, the French invention. And uh, I, I, I was trying to get somebody to get the whole report to read it. Actually, I did meet some art historians who I encouraged to look into that period in France. And I think they did begin to. One of them wrote to me, finding things, but I said it's a good, you could start scrutinizing things there. And uh, uh, it's still open. I mean, it should be looked into. For instance, um, I was going around the, you know, Thorvaldsen Museum here, and there's wonderful reliefs. There's, I mean, it's a great museum. It's in a massive hall with the horses. And it's quite a long time since I've been in. I went two days ago, yeah, to take JP. And uh, looking at those reliefs, Beautiful. He was a terrific sculptor, wasn't he? And uh, looking at them, uh, if you look at just before photography, there, are, there was a whole school of kind of trompe l'oeil painters imitating these reliefs. Now, a camera would show these reliefs very good because there's not much depth in them. Because there's not much depth, a camera will get and create a very strong illusion because the depth is only that much. And uh, there are paintings of, of um, reliefs. And those paintings were probably made with cameras because it's very difficult to accurately put the shadows like that in the painting. And uh, the problems of sculpture are different from painting. They are different. Because the sculpture is using space in three dimensions. Remember, painting and everything is working on, on one plane, two dimensions. Uh, these reliefs, there, there are a lot of paintings. And then the moment photography comes, there's a lot of early photographs of those reliefs. So they're there before the invention and then after. And... Uh, there's, in fact, there's a, quite a few subjects that are there uh, in painting and then there immediately after photography. So the ca I'm pointing out there was a connection with the camera, you see. And art history doesn't deal with this yet, yet. Um, uh, it will have to, I think, it will have to, somebody will.